can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. This interview is part of the Top Israel Business Leader Series. You should check out past guests, include um, Moise Navone of Mobileye, when he talks about the Mobileye journey, being acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion. Talk to um, uh, Yuri Adoni, is the author of The Unstoppable Startup, Mastering Israel's Secret Rules of Chutzpah. If you don't know Chutzpah, look it up. Uh, he wanted to share the secrets to Israel's incredible track record and and uh, Yuri was like, you must have Jonathan Medved on. You must have Jonathan Medved on. So today's guest. Um, also check out uh, uh, Yossi Vardy, um, who's amazing as well. Um, this episode, before we get to introducing today's guest, is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients. Basically, we help your company run your podcast so it generates ROI. You know, for me, John, the number one thing in my life is relationships, and I'm always looking to give to my best relationships, and a podcast has allowed me to profile others' thought leadership companies and really give to them. Um, so if you have questions about podcasting in general, go to rise25.com, um, and actually, John, the, the inspiration was more personal for me. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor, and um, his legacy lives on on my about page on Inspired Insider because of a interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him. So I can watch it, my kids can watch it, my grandkids will be able to watch that interview. He's not alive anymore to tell that story, to tell those stories, but it lives on. So um, people can check that out as well. Uh, today's guest, Jonathan Medved, is a serial entrepreneur. 2008, New York Times publication, it was named one of the top 10 most influential Americans who have impacted Israel. He's the co-founder uh, and founder CEO of Our Crowd, the world's largest equity crowdfunding platform from accredited investors, which has raised more than $1 billion from over 170 companies since its launch in 2013. And prior to our crowd, Jonathan was the co-founder and CEO of Vringo, which went public and the co-founder and general partner of Israel Seed Partners with $262 million under management. Um, John, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. You know, I was watching... Um, the uh, the other day interview, uh, you and it was you and Barbara Corcoran, and on stage, okay, <laughs> and um, you. Um, that was a lot of fun. You know who was actually uh, hosting that interview it was uh, Betty Lou from Bloomberg. Yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, um, it was a great discussion. People should check it out. But you said something that struck me, which was um, uh, I was a wild-eyed hippie who moved to Israel. Okay. So what was John like then? What was going on in your life then when you went to, when you made your pilgrimage to Israel? Well, I mean, I, I don't think that I've actually changed that much. Maybe my hair is a little shorter. Uh, I'm wearing, you know, rather than, than rags, I'm wearing uh, Hawaiian shirts. Um, but I'm still a, a, a dreamer. You know, I, 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 I grew up in Southern California. I was born in 55. So, you know, peak of the baby boom. Had a fairly idyllic childhood. Uh, my parents were both professionals. My mom was a biochemist, became a teacher. My dad was a, a solid state physicist who became an entrepreneur. Was actually a rocket scientist, surfer. I grew up in Brentwood. Uh, you know, came from a, a strong Jewish family where the uh, the grandparents had been observant on both sides, but my, my parents sort of ran away from all that when they left the East Coast and came West and sort of broke the shackles of tradition in California. And in my neighborhood, you know, there were lots of Jews and it, you know, was certainly no disadvantage to be Jewish. I had no anti-Semitism growing up, you know, in Pacific Palisades in Brentwood, that simply you know, was uh, D class and, and pretty stupid, actually, if you tried to do that. But I didn't do much, right? In other words, there wasn't that much to do. I mean, we were considered sort of fanatics in the neighborhood because we actually had a Passover Seder at our house. 
there wasn't a lot of observance, let's say, in the west side of L.A. And uh, I was very active in the anti-war movement and the moratorium and worked for the United Farm Workers and tutored kids in the ghetto. And I, I did a lot of sort of typical Jewish liberal stuff, which I enjoyed very much, and then went on to Berkeley, which was sort of a, uh, a natural progression. And uh, I wanted to go spend uh, a summer after my freshman year somewhere else. And I didn't really have the money, so I had to go back to my parents and ask nicely, would they cover you know, some costs somewhere? And they looked at me and said, well, what are you thinking about? And I said, well, probably Mexico or Spain, because I still spoke pretty well Spanish and it sounded cool and exotic. And they looked at me and said, not a chance. The only place you'll get a penny from us is if you go to Israel. <laughs> and, you know, uh, so the bottom line is I went and found my way to Israel. It was 1973, before the war. And it was this idyllic little country with 2 million people today, you know, almost 10 million in Israel. No startup nation. Many of the same issues, but many different issues. And I, I really fell in love. I fell hard for the place. But then I came back to the States and a week later, the war broke out. And that war was a traumatic experience for Israel and for the Jewish people. And on my campus, Berkeley, there were all these complete lunatics who were just a little bit ahead of their time yelling death to the Jews. Okay, and that was the first time that I ever experienced that you know my people had a struggle. So that's what hooked me. It was both the sort of up and excitement of being in Israel combined with <clears throat> the need to actually do something or do something. And uh, I ended up going back to Israel every summer during college, taught myself Hebrew, uh, became very active on the campus. And ultimately in 1980, seven years after my first trip, I, I moved to Israel and haven't looked back since. Met my wife now have four kids. They have produced for me nine grandchildren. Wow. And uh, I've been a sort of a frontline actor on the, in the startup nation story. That's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, on campus, when that was going on, um, you were involved in things that were going on. Um, what were some things that you saw or did during that time period? <laughs> There's some of them I can't talk about. <laughs> I'd like to, maybe over drinks, but certainly not on a podcast. Uh, I mean, look, I, I remember in 1975, um, we got word that Yasser Arafat at that time was going to speak at the UN, his famous speech where he came with the, the pistol in his belt. And uh, he was supposedly going to talk about peace, but he was talking about Zionism as racism. And it was just a, you know, and we got word uh, in the morning that um, the uh, Arab Students Association were going to have a big rally in honor of that. And then the Jews couldn't organize where there was like no time. So I went to my bed and instead of going crawling back into bed, which you probably would have liked to do, grabbed a sheet, cut a hole in it, got some white face, put it all over my face, and then took a bottle of ketchup and poured it all over myself. And I made a, sa a sign which said on it, Ma'alot, which was the name of the Israeli school where uh, PLO terrorists had gone in and had butchered like 30 kids. And so I put this around my neck and I walked to campus. Now there was, you know, in, in Berkeley in those days, we called it berserkly. Every day was worse than Halloween. No one actually even looked at me twice because I was just another- Really? Freak. Really? <laughs> Well, maybe some people, especially when they realized there was like a trail of bees following me because of the ketchup. Uh, but in any event, I, I just walked up to the famous Sproul Plaza, and there was this quite large demonstration, and I just proceeded to walk up to the podium and stood there. And a bunch of people sort of then began to take notice of me, and the organizer said, you can't stand here this is a, a demonstration. And I said, uh, this is, a, uh, you know, Sproul Plaza and a free speech and I'm gonna stand here. And so they tried to get the campus cops to move me. They tried to threaten me. It looked rather, but the, ultimately through the entire protest, 
they did not manage to move me. And all of the TV, all the pictures show the speaker next to this sort of white ghost with the blood and the Mahmoud wow. sign. And um, that caught the eye of some organizers from what's called the Jewish Agency, which was the department, you know, really it's sort of a quasi-governmental organization who then sent me an invitation to go be an itinerant campus organizer. They made me an offer I, I could not refuse, which is leave school, we'll give you a car, we'll give you a 16 millimeter film projector. This is obviously pre, you know, videotape. We'll give you all the propaganda you can demonstrate or, or you know, distribute. And then you can drive around Western states campuses and organize, you know, students for Israel. It will pay you 600 bucks a month. And I said, oh, great, I'm in. Okay, that was like my dream job. <laughs> and uh, that was really the first full-time job I ever had. Wow. Helped. John, talk about chutzpah, right? I mean, were you worried about your safety? I mean, you're one person among many people at that point. Look, I've done a lot of crazy things. <laughs> I'm not, you know, people ask you when, you know, when you live in Israel, you're afraid for your safety. And the answer is absolutely not. Israel is a incredibly safe and wonderful, sort of a little bit reminds me of my childhood in the 50s. It's great for, you know, kids or women to take buses late at night. And it's, it's a very, uh, I, I just don't, I don't think about those things. Okay, I'm worried a little bit about COVID, believe it or not, because I'm, you know, approaching that age of risk groups and I've got, a, you know, clearly carrying a little more weight than I should and uh, things like that. But I typically don't have time to worry about that stuff. Yeah. I just want to go out and have fun and, and do things. And I, I don't, I'm not stupid about risk, but I, you know, sort of am in a, a risk accepting career. Yeah. Right. And yeah. uh, in general, Israelis attitudes towards risk are a little bit on the, the risk acceptance side of the spectrum. Yeah. I guess that translates into um, risk in investing in startups, right? I mean, uh, investing and starting them. You know, yeah. I mean, the bottom line is it goes, I mean, look, to be Jewish has often meant risk and risk acceptance, you know, even before the state of Israel. Um, it's been about dreams, about seeing things that other people don't see, about being a minority that somehow chased. And a lot of this, believe it or not, has much to do with the sort of secret sauce, whether you call it chutzpah or, you know, or something else that, that drives Israeli entrepreneurial, both activity as well as investors. And um, it, it's just part of the culture, right? It, it's, it's like, and what happens is that you get this group think going where everybody's sort of like, that's normal. You know, there's a friend of mine, Muli Eden, who ran Intel here. And he, and he famously says, well, the only way to really get an Israeli R&D team to, you know, get their butts in gear and get something done is to tell them that what they're trying to do is impossible. Mm. Okay. You know, when you say that that's impossible, you can't do that. That's how you get Israelis to, to go. Okay. You know, but that's, we go back to Abraham, right? You know, he said, I see God, but he's not a, in physical form. Right, he was the first immigrant, really, very famous immigrant, who you know came and there was no welcome wagon there. They, you know, in Sodom, they were not particularly welcoming to you know uh, newcomers. And uh, what did he start to do? He started to make friends and to influence people. He became wealthy. Our tradition has no sort of uh, sanctification of poverty. Okay, in other words. Uh, uh, Jews have, have, have always been, you know, people who overachieved, okay? And everyone asks about that. And the fact that Israel today is a startup nation with a tremendous, vibrant economy, that shouldn't surprise anybody. If we were slouches, that would be the surprise, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, look, there's so much about Jews in the discourse at the moment. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, it, it helps to have sort of clarity, okay? Yes, there are way, way more Jews in the Forbes 400 than our population accounts for. But guess what? 30% of the world's Nobel Prizes in sciences are awarded over the last 100 years to Jews. 
okay? The Jewish population of the world is about one-tenth of a percent, okay? It's, it's, it's non-existent. So, you know, what is that about? Why are there so many Jewish playwrights? Why are there so many Jewish actors? And our enemies, unfortunately, still, you know, some around, may, may they, you know, meet, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming of, of sense to their, their madness, they think it's because of a conspiracy, the fact that Jews don't play fair. That, that, and if anybody who knows Jews knows how disorganized, how the, the idea of a Jewish conspiracy, Jews keeping their mouth shut, okay, give me a break, it can't happen. Okay, so the, the, the bottom line is that um, Israel is this just, in sometimes infuriating, exhilarating, exciting, fun, different kind of place. And when I came here as a kid, I, I fell hard for it. And I've only grown, you know, in terms of my love and appreciation, and sometimes the infuriating nature of when we screw things up. I mean, right now, we're way ahead of the curve, right? We were the first country to beat the virus, and then it came roaring back because we opened everything up, and now our, you know, infection rate is uh, uh, one of the highest in the world. Turns out that our mortality rate is, I think, the lowest or one of the lowest in the world. People don't die here. We've had about less than 600 deaths, but a lot of us are getting infected and uh, it infuriates the hell out of me because we should, we should have been smarter than that. So John, why do you think there's that disproportionate amount of startups, Nobel Prize winners, funding, all that? I think it's um, attitudes towards risk, towards education, towards, uh, the future, okay. In other words, we're we're a future-oriented. The fact that we've survived thousands of years, the fact that we're back here, and my grandkids can dig in our backyard and find a pottery shard that has an ancient language which they can read because it's the same language we've been speaking and reading for thousands of years. We're the only case of an indigenous people who have come home. Okay, after being expelled from their land, you know, uh, we're trying to make it work with our neighbors. Okay, and uh, when you think about the fact that Israel today is like almost 10 million people, that we are the, the world's second most vibrant startup location after Silicon Valley, really the world's second Silicon Valley. This year, there will be about $10 billion invested in Israeli startups. That is an insane number. Last year was 8 billion and change. Okay, we already did in the first uh, seven months over six. Okay, we're going up in a COVID year. My business at our crowd, which provides a way for uh, investors outside of Israel to invest in Israeli startups or startups around the world, um, we're having an up year despite the virus. So what's that about? I mean, and, and what, what, what that's about, in my opinion, is this sort of unstoppable force that says, you know what, the world has issues, we got to fix them. Whether you believe it's called tikkun olam, which means fixing the world, or it's just like I've got to do something. Um, this is a fairly energetic place, okay? And there are a lot of people who are dreamers, but now there's a lot of people with money who will back these dreamers and help them. And it's a great job to be a venture capitalist, to be able to be an enabler of people realizing their dreams. Talk about that. You know, you talk about technology as an equalizer and you traveling to countries where you probably couldn't get a passport and going to those countries because of technology. Yeah, well, I, I've got two passports, right? My, yeah. my, actually, my grandkids have four. Uh, so they might, you know, uh, <laughs> even travel more than I do. But uh, no, I've got both, I retain my American and my Israeli passport, so I can pretty much get anywhere in the world. Um, look, people today are fascinated by innovation. As you know, you're doing the, you know, this podcast with innovators and leaders. And it, it's, it's not just culturally sort of hip and, and, and woke to be uh, you know, building you know, cool startups, but Really, I think the, 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 the cutting edge now is what I call 
the double bottom line where people are making money and, and doing good at the same time. So whether you're investing in a startup that's tackling the COVID vaccine, or you're investing in a startup which is making old people not lonely, or you're investing in a startup which is gonna help farmers grow more food and feed the world, or investing in a startup which is giving you know, Indian farmers the ability to get weather prediction for the first time, there's no question that that stuff is necessary for making a more complete and better place for all of us to live. Uh, on the other hand, these people will get rich and their investors will make a good return. And that's a great thing too, because I don't think that people who are successful are necessarily uh, predators or jerks or evil people. I think that somehow uh, money making has gotten a bad rap, okay? And the, the issue is more about democratization of access, not trying to make everybody poor together, but trying to make everybody have the chance to get rich together. Some people don't want to. Okay, some people would rather, you know, focus on other things. That's fine. Some people don't have the skills, and that's unfortunate because you have to really figure out a way to provide people with the education and the network. But uh, in, in general, the thing that drives me is building a platform which allows this playing field to be leveled so that entrepreneurs around the world can get the cash they need to go build a company, and then investors around the world can invest in startups the way they would, you know, call their broker and, 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 and buy a stock. You know, if someone checks out our crowd, you've vetted probably over 10,000 companies, right? Portfolio companies, 200. So what do you look at when you are investing in a company? I look at the people. It, you know, it really depends on the stage, but the earlier the stage, the more you always look at people because this is a people business. And when you succeed, you say that person was an unbelievable person, okay? Uh, or they built a great team. Um, when they fail, you say he's a jerk, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you notice I use the, the male gender. I mean, there are women jerks too, but uh, more men. Um, the, uh, I don't know if that's politically correct today, but who cares? <laughs> I don't know if um, jerk has ever been considered not politically correct, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, so, you know, you, you look for people who have a fire in their eyes and maybe in their belly. Uh, I've got a considerable belly. The, you look for people who have a good network and a track record, who are ethical and have integrity, who listen as well as can, you know, tell a story because to a lot, you know, and, and, and that, that's where you start. Now, if it's a later stage company and they've actually got a product, you look for traction, you look for, you know, are they selling this effectively? Who are their customers or their, I mean, I was just literally about an hour ago hearing a pitch from one of our companies that's just doing spectacularly. And you see this, you know, uh, hockey stick where he was showing his revenue. And I'm saying, ah, thank God, you look at this thing and it's just like going straight up. And it's one of these companies that's being helped by uh, the crisis. There are lots of companies, and this is, you know, one of the things that really isn't getting enough coverage, um, that where the startups, because of the rapid transformation, you know, to digital everything, are really getting tailwind rather than headwind. Now, everybody understands that in public stocks like Zoom or Amazon, you know, that, okay, sure, that, you know, this, these are part of the zeitgeist. But there are a lot of private pandemic plays that luckily, you know, we have many who were investments before the crisis and are now seeing the benefit. And then we have a bunch that we've added and there are a bunch that have pivoted, you know, into the crisis, right? Who have taken their business and, and said, okay, but wait a minute, we can do this too. And uh, it's not about all, you know, by the way, doing medical stuff, but also just relating to the new normal. So when you look at, you know, the changes that we're all going through, uh, work from home, for example, this is, a, this is not a temporary blip on our cultural or civilizational uh, radar. The new this normal. Is a, yeah, it is totally the new normal. And whether it's Twitter or Facebook saying, you know, don't bother coming back, 
okay, we, we're happy. You know, Intel today making another statement about, you know, working from home. And so any company that enables this, and by the way, so, you know, yes, we have Zoom, great. But we need a whole bunch of other tools to make this work. Okay, we need improved cybersecurity, you know, to protect our remote access to the sort of crown jewels of our, of our companies. There's tremendous amounts of stuff needed to make the new normal work. And uh, that we're interested in. We're also interested, you know, uh, in healthcare. And in particular, the telemedicine. We had a recent uh, online conference where the uh, CEO of Johns Hopkins Health got on. And he said that in the near future, 30% of all doctor visits will move to telemedicine. Wow. Okay. And I think, by the way, he's underestimating. I think it'll be much higher. But when you realize what a monstrous opportunity, I mean, because the, the telemedicine tools and frameworks we have today, and we have several companies working on this, are still in their infancy, right? We haven't, we haven't even begun to build that channel out. You know, um, we have a company doing, uh, you know, remittances, you know, for foreign w workers who are sending money home and are now a challenger bank because they provide them banking. Turns out that they were acquiring lots of their customers uh, from like partnerships with pharmacies and physical locations. And only 20% were digital customers. Now all of a sudden 60 or 70% are digital customers. So the, you know, the, the changes here are, are, fundamental and once digital ground is taken it's never seeded right in other words you're never going to have a situation where these digital companies who took market share against you know uh uh old-fashioned retail are gonna say okay we'll give it back to you that that's gone we're not going back again there is no going home okay and people who have this sort of uh nostalgic view of, okay, it will, you know, this will end. I don't know if it's six months or three months or a year, we're going back to the world before this crisis. Forget about it, as they say in Queens. It's not going to happen, right? We, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of depressing on a certain level, but grow up and move forward because life is about one constant, which is everything changes. John, you mentioned companies, you know, I had um, uh, the founder of Clue, uh, Gal Salman on talking about their technology. And I'm wondering what companies should people look out for that have been, they're involved in our crowd? What are some of the companies and what do they do? Oh my God. <laughs> do we have, how many hours do we have? <laughs> Weeks? Um, look, just this uh, last week, and I don't know when this will air, but uh, one of our companies, Zebra Medical, who uses AI to uh, analyze and detect uh, diseases through uh, just the most amazing interpretation of radiological images, right? They use the AI with a bunch of data they've collected to help the radiologist and the uh, clinician to understand things. So they just announced their sixth clearance from the FDA for mammography or for detecting breast cancer. Wow. Now, these guys, you know, are just on a roll, uh, unbelievable uh, team, brilliant people, already, you know, major deals, major investors. And uh, that's a very interesting company. We have a company called Intuition Robotics who make the, uh, something called LEQ, which is an elder care robot that 90-year-olds can talk in a stream of consciousness and it understands them. Okay, try that with Siri sometime. Good luck. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, they are obviously having a huge amount going on. Last week, we announced a $71 million round of funding for our company, Site Diagnostics, who are making a two uh, drop complete blood count test, which re might remind you of that other company that proposed to do that and didn't succeed except that this has been cleared by the FDA and $71 million of very smart money just was raised to you know, bring it more aggressively to market. And they're actually using it uh, to treat COVID patients in quarantine and all kinds of great things like that. Um, we have so many companies in the food area where investors in Ripple who are doing 
you know, plant-based. I've had Ripple. Milk. Oh, yeah. Delicious product. I went to a milk. ice cream store that was, had a whole plant-based uh, menu be, made from Ripple. So yeah. Ripple is a big deal. And we were very happy investors in something called Beyond Meat, which oh, was yeah. the best IPO of last year. Uh, we had a, a really great IPO this year in a company called Lemonade, which is not a food tech, but an insurance company that uh, went public and now trades at over a $3 billion market cap. Um, we, uh, you know, every, every year we're doing about 100 different deals on our crowd. And they are about 40 of them are new deals, new companies that we're investing in. We're investing now in a company. And by the way, uh, only about 55% uh, of our companies are in Israel and about 45% are outside of Israel. And um, we're doing a, a big chunk in the U.S. So we're investing in a company called Tovala right now. which I is interviewed a, them. I interviewed Tovala. Okay. Founder. So yeah, David, he's an yeah. unbelievable uh, yeah. uh, CEO out of Chicago, and uh, his sales are going through the roof. And you know, he uses this smart oven, which basically, you know, scans a barcode, automatically cooks this beautiful food mm -hmm. from uh, you know essentially raw ingredients to making it fresh, delicious, healthy meals. Yeah. And and that's also been helped by the by the crisis. So. You know, we, we have food, we have cybersecurity, uh, you know, a wonderful company called Six Gill, who are helping companies protect themselves against threats in the dark web. Companies like BioCatch, which Bain Capital just led a $145 million round, uh, you know, to expand that. They can understand who you are by how you hold uh, a phone. We, look, we have actually now 220 portfolio companies. Wow. Um, we've invested a billion and a half uh, in, uh, you know, funding and funding commitments to our uh, our 220 companies and 22 different funds. We just launched a pandemic innovation fund, which is a new fund that's focused on uh, essentially both companies that are benefiting from the new normal, as well as companies that uh, are are working on, you know, therapeutics and vaccines. We have the, the leading oral vaccine candidate, a company called MIGVAX, where we led a $12 million round. Uh, it is amazing stuff. We, we believe that just like uh, Salk got to the vaccine for po uh, polio first, but Sabin won because he had the oral vaccine. We're big believers in oral vaccines. And we're hmm. counting on this group who had uh, really you know, perfected their technology on chickens. They started by fighting coronavirus for chickens, believe it or not, and then they transitioned and pivoted into the, the human coronavirus. John, who, from an investor standpoint, can get involved with our crowd? Like if someone wants uh, to get anybody involved. Anybody who's an accredited investor, uh, mm -hmm. you know, basically in America, you have to have either a million dollars of uh, net assets outside of your primary dwelling uh, that you can uh, prove or a annual income of $200,000 plus. Now, it turns out that according to studies, there are about 14 million households in America who meet that criteria. So that's a big slug of people. And of course, we take people from all over the world. So we estimate that we're dealing with about 100 million, uh, you know, arguably wealthy people, but, you know, people who start with a, a million or $2 million up to, you know, billionaires who have billions of dollars. And What's cool about it is that we're for the first time giving these people unfettered access to a bunch of really interesting startups. Not all of them succeed. Obviously, we've had 20 failures that uh, some have been spectacular and uh, unfortunate, uh, but we've had 40 exits of which the majority of those have been very good ones, uh, including, you know, the companies I mentioned like Beyond Meat or Lemonade or companies like Rewalk that went public and, and others. John, what about, so when I was talking to Yossi, he said his biggest miss was Waze. And um, I'm wondering from your standpoint, what you've well, my seen. Biggest, my biggest miss was Yossi's company, uh, Mirabilis, back in the day. Back <laughs> really? Even, 
even passed out little bumper stickers that said in Hebrew, Gamanilo Ishkati Bamrabalis. There were so many people that, which meant I too did not invest in uh, Yossi's company. <laughs> because he went around to all these guys and I said, you're crazy. You don't have any money. There's no business model. And what the hell, back in those days, he didn't need it. He sold it to, you know, AOL for 400 billion. So no, look, I've had a bunch of uh, misses. You have misses all the time. Okay, my biggest miss in reality as a, a, com a small company called Salesforce. Uh, I'm friendly with Mark Benioff. He was going to take me as an angel investor and he said, I'll hold you know, a, a good chunk of this equity. And I asked him what his valuation was on the seed round and he told me, and I said, you're crazy. This is insane. You know, I know I love you, Mark, but this does not make sense economically. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> <Boy>. <laughs> Um, John, I want to talk about your dad's influence on you. And there was a point you, your dad took you to a meeting and what someone said to you that maybe, I don't know if that changed the course of what you're doing or, or not, but it, I, it talk did. about that. It, it did. So I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, there's that guy standing next to a plane. That's my father. Hmm. He wasn't a fighter pilot, but he was a scientist astronaut. They had a program back in the sixties and the seventies in the States to go recruit scientists to become astronauts because they wanted them to both be able to go to space and to do experimentation. My dad was that kind of a guy. And uh, after, shortly after I came to Israel to live, and I was doing a bunch of itinerant organizing and tour guiding and thinking of going to get an advanced history degree, you know, a bunch of things. My father shows up with a little startup, which he had uh, started in our basement in our house with six people doing something called fiber optic communications. And this was 1982. Uh, so it was like literally just a couple of years after AT&T had cut over their first fiber link. Mm. And uh, he said, look, I wanna write this whole trip to Israel, which was essentially a trip to see how I was doing off. So, uh, well, you know, will you accompany me to a meeting up at this military plant in the north of Israel called Raphael, north of Haifa. And uh, you'll translate. So I said, Dad, sure, I'll, we'll go up there. It'll be a fun day. He didn't, he didn't need any translation. These guys spoke a lot better English than my Hebrew. <laughs> uh, and, but I was bored to tears because they were talking about fiber optics and harmonic distortion and signal-to-noise ratios and you know the, uh, whether it would work in step index or graded index fibers. And I had no clue because I, I had never studied physics or optics or anything close at, at, at Cal. I'm not sure I studied that much at Cal, frankly, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> but in any event, uh, at the end of this thing, one of these guys turns to me and says, okay, Medved Jr., what are you doing? And I told him. And he looked at me and said, what a complete waste in Hebrew. So my father wouldn't hear it. And I wouldn't be embarrassed. And I said, you know, Mapitom, which is WTF in Hebrew, Okay, you know, what are you talking about? My life is a waste. I mean, why aren't we dancing the horror here? And you're saying, welcome home, brother. And he says, you don't get it. You know, we don't need more guys like you. We need guys like your dad. We need people who are going to build companies with six mm -hmm. people and cutting edge technology. And he made this sort of two minute pitch about Startup Nation before it really had existed. And so on the trip back to to Jerusalem, I sat with my father and I said, Dad, what are you doing exactly? He goes, well, for you to understand this, son, it starts with Ohm's Law. <laughs> you know, and he wanted to give me a, my father was a professor, and he wanted to give me a lecture. By the end of the week that he was with me, he had agreed to give me $100 a month as a, uh, a stipend, which by the way, covered about two thirds of my rent, which was a big deal. And he said, keep in touch with these guys at Raphael, look for some more customers, and if you like this, maybe you can join me in the business. I liked it. I joined in the business. I was his first fundraiser and raised $600,000 in a, my first fundraising. I, I, I liked raising money. And uh, make a long story short, we built this fiber optic company together called Merit and uh, sold it to Amico, the big oil company, about eight years later. Merit Optical. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I know we have a little bit of time left, but there, there's so, you know, 
from uh, Merit Optical, Israel Seed Partners, Varengo to our crowd. What, um, I don't know, story sticks out among, uh, I guess, why did you start our crowd? So, you know, I, I've been, a, I was a venture capitalist for 11, 12 years, running one of the sort of premier funds in Israel. A lot of our people went on to go create even bigger funds. We're sort of a little bit of a mafia. Israel Seed was a great experience. I built several startups, took them public or sold them, um, been an angel investor. And after my last adventure, which was this company called Vringo, which was doing uh, video sharing on apps before even the iPhone was launched. <laughs> we, were, we started working on the wow. N70 with Symbian. Uh, and uh, got that public, got it merged, made money, my investors made money, and I then went on a speaking tour. And one of the things I like to do is to talk about Israel and the technology. And I went around to all these communities, not just in America and Europe, but also in Asia. And people would come up to me afterwards and say, okay, I'm in. Uh, how do I write you a check? And I said, no, you don't. I used to have a venture fund and we're not raising money now. No, no, no. I want to invest in Israeli startups. And they said, can I call my broker at, at Goldman or Morgan? I said, no. And then all of a sudden I went back and I took all these business cards and I looked at them and I had stuffed them in some shoe boxes and they were starting to build a little wall. And I said, wait a minute, maybe I can, you know, use this thing called crowdfunding where, you know, me and a team will go find deals like I've done before as an angel and a venture capitalist. We'll put them up online and then let people have a go at it. And I talked to a bunch of my friends, especially lawyers about the regulatory. And uh, most of them said, look, this is a stupid idea. And if you do it, you're going to go to jail and I'll bring you kosher food to Lebanon. <laughs> okay? and I said, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's actually legal. When you look at the way that we were going to do it with, uh, you know, 506B and private, and we found a way to make this work from a regulatory standpoint. And we got started and we haven't looked back. And now we're a billion and a half into it with, uh, you know, good track record. And the idea was to first connect people to Israel, which was always interesting to me. But beyond that, just let people have a piece of this bonanza called startup investing. Because in the old days, if you had uh, invested in Microsoft or Apple or Oracle, back when they went public and you held them, you make a thousand times your money because guys went public early. But today people don't go public early. They build unicorns. There are you know, 500 plus of them around the world. And so the public gets invited in after the party's pretty much over, okay? Sometimes they'll go up, you know, Beyond Meat's been a great performer in the public market. It's, you know, trading even today at about five or six times, you know, what it went public at. But it ain't a thousand times. And the people who really made money there were the people who got in early. And so it turns out that even wealthy people with millions of dollars can't get access to these deals, right? Venture capital as traditionally practiced, you gotta come with a five or $10 million check as a limited partner. You probably should be picking two or three or four uh, managers minimum. So you gotta invest like 20 or $30 million and you shouldn't have more than three or 4% of your assets in this rather risky asset class, even though Yale University and their endowment has 20%, but most people should limit themselves three, four, 5%. That means you gotta be a billionaire. So what does a poor schmuck who's got like $5 million do, okay, who wants to invest in startups? And he doesn't live in Silicon Valley and you know, can't talk to his uh, uh, parents on carpool about, about cool startups. And the answer is they, you can suck on the wind, right? And, and, and that's why we started our crowd and it, it's worked. And I think that, you know, it's hard work because we're managing to maintain venture best practices. We do diligence on every deal that we look at. We invest our own capital. We manage the investments, right? We uh, put people on boards. You know, we, we are responsible stewards, okay, of, of capital. We take this very seriously. And, uh, but we make it available. So individuals can actually pick these companies that we spoke about 
and invest minimums starting at $10,000. And they can also, if they don't want to have to pick companies, but they want to have uh, managed funds, they can do that from $50,000. So it's not 5 million as a minimum, but 50. John, so much to talk about, but I want to point people towards ourcrowd.com. Check it out. And John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, for sharing your journey. I, I really enjoyed this and I look forward to coming back and spending more time and remembering fun times in the past and hopefully talking a little bit more about the future. Thank you. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I feel like a hundred grand.